today. And one of the reasons he's so special, he's actually a good friend of mine. Uh, I've had the recent pleasure of doing some new investments with him, me as an individual. So it's one of the reasons we kind of wanted to bring him back in and bring him back to us to give some you know, insight of certain things on the oil and gas industry. Now, if you've never spent time with us on our self-directed Saturday, leverage that chat box right down below. You guys can network and pitch your own deals with one another, all right? You can obviously t- talk with the speaker and make sure you guys are asking questions. We're going to save t- room for the end of this presentation to make sure that everyone has a chance to ask questions to myself and our uh, headline speaker today. Now, without any further ado, I want to bring up uh, Troy Ecker. Troy, are you with me today? I'm here. Hey, Derek. Good morning to you. Awesome. Awesome. Now, normally I give this whole little presentation right in the beginning, but I think today is very important for us to dive right on in because I know we have a lot of information. Now, I don't want to give too much about your background and stuff. I'm going to let you take it away. I'm sitting here the whole time. Quick disclaimer, guys, this is all for educational purposes, right? And Troy will tell you the same thing. Neither of us are here to, you know, give investment advice or legal advice or tax advice. We're here to mainly talk about how we can use our retirement accounts and invest in things like mineral rights and oil and gas. So that's what we're here for today. Troy, let's take it away. Hey, thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Troy Eckert. I'm the CEO and uh, manager of Eckert Enterprises, and I'm headquartered in Allen, Texas. And first off, I just want to give a little bit of kudos back to Quest and to Derek. Um, we have developed a business relationship over the last two years as both Quest as well as our firm have worked diligently to try to bring educational information to the self-directed IRA market. Um, having been involved in investments since 1985, uh, I can't even count the number of transitional changes that have occurred over the investment space since that time. Uh, the reality of it is, is that we are in uncharted water when it comes to investments today. And those uncharted waters are everything from uh, the way you invest, the, uh, the methodology of investments, the macro monetary review of investments. And what's really taking place is that investors are, are literally starving for information. The problem is it's information overload. And so what we hope to do today is to maybe focus in on one particular space, which is the energy industry specifically the U.S. oil and gas space. And that's where I've focused my entire career since 1985. Um, I'll be 57 years old this uh, coming summer. Uh, I've been involved in oil and gas for almost 36 years. Uh, You'd think I'd be 80, 90 years old, but I've always been an overachiever. So I've been doing this for a very long time since I was a kid. I've had my own company for over 20 something years. And the reality of it is, is that today's Climate is substantially different than anything we've experienced before, and it has so many different facets that it's worth taking time today to listen to. Now, keep in mind, this is educational. This is for your purpose. And um, as Derek suggested, at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A button that allows you to ask questions. Whatever I don't see or answer during the presentation, uh, Derek will bring up later at the, the bottom of the hour. And of course, you also have the chat where you can chat amongst yourselves. I only point that out because sometimes you feel like you got to gag and you want to say something or comment and you feel like you're limited. Don't be afraid to write those down. If it's not appropriate or we can't squeeze it in, we won't. But I can assure you that it's Derek and my goal in this hour to give you everything that you came here to see. So let's get started. And I want to make sure I hit the right one for sharing. And let me see if I can scoot this up real quick. Okay. And I'm not seeing the full screen presentation. So let me try the other one, which is my power, which is my, sorry about that. I'm, I'm practicing. We just moved into our new offices yesterday. And as a result, we ended up with uh, somewhat of a limitation on my equipment. And I'm not seeing it again. So I'm going to wing it like it is. I don't think we have time to mess around with my technological shortcomings, but let me see if I can figure it out real quick. You're okay. You're okay. Can you, see, can you see the whole screen there? Because it kind of just left. Uh, well, it's the par- right it's side is slightly cut off. It cuts off right at the A where it says ECK. And so I don't see full of the full record. All right. So I know that's just a simple step. And Ryan showed me what to do. So I'm going to try it here real quick. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to keep talking while I fix this because I can multitask like nobody's tomorrow. So my career started off in oil and gas exploration. And when we started with the oil and gas exploration business back in the 1980s, The main thing that we were always focused on is we were focused on the tax benefit, which effectively left many of the 
uh, investors out there looking for tax deductions versus just uh, trying to uh, find out a way in which to make money. And so the oil and gas industry went through a very hardcore time from the 1980s and 1990s. And many older investors have simply walked away from uh, the uh, industry as a result of uh, not being able to make sense of it. So what's changed in the oil and gas industry over the last uh, 20 or 30 years? Well, there's been two or three key significant things that have taken place. And I just asked my IT guy to come in, Derek, to get it fixed. So we'll, we'll get it handled here in just a second. No worries. Take your time. Um, so what I wanted to do is just kind of tell you what changed and why now the market is completely appropriate for qualified investors to consider the energy space and how that may affect the rest of your investments across your platform. Now, one of the things I want you to know is that I don't just focus on oil and gas. I focus on how oil and gas works within the macro economy. In other words, what does it do to interest rate? What does it do to transportation utilities? And how that makes a possibility that you as an investor, whether it's in your self-directed IRA or whether or not it's inside your uh, regular investment account, how you need to pay attention to it. So we are in uncharted waters, as I mentioned before, and the uncharted waters are as follows. In 2008, we had a, a really interesting scenario that occurred. We had the dollar drop down into the 70s. We had oil set all-time record highs when it came to pricing. We reached about $145 a barrel for West Texas Intermediate. Now, some of you are saying, mm, okay, I, I follow that. So we had low dollar value. We had high oil prices. We all paid high at the pump. Uh, we came out of that. Oil prices dropped. The economy languished on. We changed out presidencies. We've had a great booming economy the last seven or 10 years when it comes to real estate. Um, all this is, we know that, Troy, we can read the newspaper, but let me tell you why it's important to understand the effect. Behind the scenes, behind the numbers, two things occurred that are of significant informational purposes that you need to be aware of. One, prior to the 2008 crash, the oil and gas industry in this country was running out of supplies and reserves. We were down to the lowest rate of production output since 1941. In other words, from 1941, we were at 3.8 million barrels a day. That then transferred uh, over the next, next 30 years to up to over 10 million barrels a day by the early 1970s. Then we ended up seeing a condition where the oil was being consumed. We didn't have enough technology to find replacement. Population grew, industrialization grew, uh, mobility grew. And then all of a sudden, we, were, uh, we started seeing that we were consuming more than we were supplying. Decline curves occurred in the wells. Next thing you know, we're back down in 2008 to the same level of output as 1941. Wow. Now we're at 336 million people in the country and we're producing as much oil only as we did in 1941. Oil prices shot up to $145 a barrel. As a result of pure economic incentives, um, what ended up happening is that we now had a country that was, was pressed, pressed to the hill to figure out how to call, create a solution to the problem. I've always said in my career that if somebody had enough monetary incentive, we could probably solve cancer tomorrow. There's not enough financial incentive to solve cancer. So therefore, there's more incentive into curing cancer from the standpoint of chemotherapy and trying to prolong life. Oil and gas is the same way. We know where there is literally billions and billions of barrels of oil, but we also know that it's not where... It's not where we want to be when it comes to financial returns. And that nothing happens in the world. I'm sending a text to my IT guy again. Um, two seconds. Okay. Now, nothing occurs on the planet unless the investors decide it's worth their time and their risk. So when you think about oil and gas being a, a very subjective industry, not knowing how to drill, most of us are completely, uh, most of the investors are completely unaware of what goes on in the oil and gas space we have a tendency to pull back and not go in to the ability of understanding where we want to take a serious investment position. What we do is we look at how oil and gas affects our overall portfolio. When oil prices go high, we see utility prices going high. We see raw goods go high. We see transportation go high. And we start looking at how the negative effect to like our real estate portfolio is when we start looking at net operating income, how the consumers adjust their consuming power. Here's what I think we're going to see and what we have seen over the last five to seven years. Oil and gas industry became very proficient. The first and foremost thing is because we learned how to drill in these large shale basins located over 30 states, we didn't recognize that due to the expiration techniques that we were using, the horizontal drilling, and because of the frac stimulations, basically pumping in sand and water and breaking up these reservoirs, 
we figured out the United States has all the oil and gas it needs. We no longer had to rely upon Saudi Arabia and, and foreign countries because we had plenty of oil and gas here in the United States. And now we had the technology to extract it. Capital flooded to the oil and gas industry since 2009 and said, now that you as an industry have solved the problem, now we know how to come in and help you with investment dollars to now cultivate or through exploitation, be able to extract enough oil and gas to make a positive cash flow return, prove up billions of dollars worth of reserves. And now we are creating our own self uh, industry or self-perpetuating industry that allows us to become less dependent on foreign oil. I'm getting to the point here in a second, just bear with me. The problem is anytime you have a new industry, whether it's technology, whether it's space programs, whether it's oil and gas exploration, where the final result can't quite be uh, capsuled, capsulized, like building a building. I know it's going to be 10 stories tall. It's going to cost us much money with a margin of error. It's very uh, uh, objective. Oil and gas is very subjective. It's subjective as to quantity. It's subjective to cost. It's subjective into terms of commodity prices upon the sale. So capital enters that market, but it enters it with a, with a degree of expectation of high returns. And those high returns are what's necessary to draw the amount of capital that you can put into something like a subjective oil and gas project. Well, that came. We had 150 to 300 billion dollars invested in the oil and gas industry the last 10 years. The successful results were the second part of the equation of the reason why there's a dynamic shift in oil and gas. I used to be involved in multiple exploration programs over the last 35 years, and it was always a function of how many um, dry holes you would drill, what your percentage of success would be, how much oil and gas you found for the dollars that were spent. But you always had that that big background noise of dry hole, dry hole, dry hole. When the shale drilling occurred, what they recognized is that it's not really the amount of dry holes because dry holes are just not really something that's predicated inside a shale drilling. You're going to hit virtually every single well you drill. If you drill inside these deep, buried, huge Grand Canyons, it's just a function of how much quantity you'll get versus how much you spend. So it's a manufacturing process. It's an ex exploitation process of how much you'll get for the dollar spent. And in that case, one of the most dynamic parts of the oil and gas industry changed. Capital providers weren't worried about loss of capital. They were worried about rate of return on capital. Big, big, big change in the industry. The other thing that occurred is that now oil companies can start looking in long-term deployment of capital. They could go out and lease 100,000 mineral acres at a time, a half a million mineral acres at a time, because they knew, one, they weren't going to drill dry holes, so it was a safe investment. Number two, they knew they could put the personnel, the equipment, they could forward purchase through procurement tanks and batteries and pipe in large, large quantities to create an aggregation of financial strength, which meant that now there was a lot of lead time in successful oil and gas drilling and production, et cetera. With that being said, there was one key element that really has kind of gone behind the back scene, behind the back curtains, okay? Now, I'm going to capsulize the last part of that little scenario. We moved from the lowest production output in 2008 and nine about 3.85 million barrels a day. And by 2020, March of last year, before the whole lockdown and Saudi Arabia, Russia or, uh, event, we ended up being at right at 13 million barrels a day in production. So almost a four times multiple of output occurred in less than 11 years. Unbelievable. I mean, we surpassed Russia, OPEC, Saudi Arabia. We surpassed all other global producers and became the number one crude oil producer in 11 months. It, it's literally like the difference between looking at a computer in 1980 and a computer today. That, that significant change didn't take 35 years. It took 11 years. Because of that, what it did was it changed the industry. The industry changed so that Saudi Arabia and Russia need about 65% of the revenue from their oil and gas sales to run their countries said, wait a minute, not only did our number one consumer that's using all that oil and gas stop buying from us, they've got enough oil, they're actually exporting oil to some of our customers. We can't afford our customers to buy from the United States energy industry. We've got to keep those customers. In fact, we've got to do whatever it takes to cut the legs off the oil and gas industry in the United States. As a result of that, what ended up happening is that the United States, who unfortunately, our underbelly has been shown the last 18 months, we're probably one of the most debt-laden countries on the planet, from consumer debt and industry debt to commercial debt. We're the number one probably country in the world that borrows money. We live on borrowed money. That's fine because you get leverage. That's horrible if your cash flow gets cut off. That's horrible if your financial uh, dynamics of your industry gets changed. Ours got changed. 
So Saudi Arabia and Russia, they claim last year they were in a dispute. That's all nonsense. That was theatrics. They decided together that they had enough money, about a half a trillion dollars apiece, to flood the market with oil, send oil prices to all-time record lows. Negative $38 a barrel was one particular trading day. And they destroyed the infrastructure of the financial metrics of the United States oil and gas industry. As a result of that, we now saw that our underbelly, which means we live on capital, that capital has uh, covenants. Each bank that lent money has to abide by the, the rules and regulations of banking. All private equity groups have to respond to the covenants of their operating documents. All the private equity in the stock market has to respond to what's the value of your reserves and stock, stock purchases. People that are in the stock market only make investments based on PE ratios and betas and all the other stock metrics that are out there. And when you take away the fundamental core part of an industry, which is the value of the assets they own, the barrels of oil and the molecules of gas in the ground, it destroys the fundamentals of that industry. That's what happened last year. Now, the thing that no one counted on, no one counted on, was the fact that the pandemic would occur almost subsequent or almost simultaneous as the flooding of oil in the US markets, or around the globe, actually. And what happened is, is that you had this huge oversupply of oil, and then you had this withdrawal of um, demand all at the same time. Catastrophic, catastrophic, more so than either Saudi Arabia, OPEC, or Russia could even imagine. And so what has happened to this industry is for the first time in my career, 35, 36 years, we now have seen what I think is going to be a long-term withdrawal of investment capital into oil and gas. You then couple that with this massive Green Deal, new administration, do everything you can to restrict, constrain, withdrawal, put up roadblocks to further development of, of oil and gas reserves in the United States. And now what you have is a situation where you're looking at rising demand. I mean, we are almost back to pre-COVID demand. We're about 19.6 million barrels a day. We had about 21 million barrels a day was demand back in March. And what we end up with is that we have a, a rising demand astronomically. Ryan's walked in. He's going to try to fix my uh, PowerPoint while I'm uh, talking. I want to finish this while he's working on me. I, I just couldn't get it to full screen. Okay. And so what's happened is, is that you have this massive withdrawal of capital out of the oil and gas industry that's never occurred before. And as a result of that, oil and gas companies have been told, you must maintain and stay within your cash flow budget to drill brand new wells. Okay, Mr. Banker, that sounds fine, except for one thing. My cash flow is down because oil prices are down. And on top of that, we now have capital withdrawing for new drilling, new exploration, and all the mineral leases that I took out have in fact uh, become uh, obsolete because I, I can't drill them in time before the lease expires. So what am I going to do? We don't care. Not only have we withdrawn, we don't even know what the final carnage is when it comes to uh, the amount of withdrawals of, of capital because we don't know quite how deep it is. And as a result of that, we are simply looking at a industry that is trying to survive on cash flow, which the cash flow is much lower as a result of lower oil prices. And at the end of the day, they're not figuring out and they don't know when, in fact, it'll ever show up as a result of new exploration opportunities to replace that supply. If you can't get him on, don't worry about it. I'll just keep going like I am. He's having some of the same trouble I am. Ah, he's my hero. Oh, no, that's great. I love the IT guys. They're my hero. So <laughs> what, we're what, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with an industry that has never before been denied oil and gas capital. And because of the new administration, and because of the social push to Green Deal, that is now being exasperated with pension funds and everybody else saying, hey, look, not only do we not want to provide capital, we want you to stop buying their stock. Well, if you stop buying Exxon stock, the stock price doesn't go up. If you stop buying stock of other service providers, their stock goes down. When their stock goes down, they have less cash to spend. So we're, we're dealing with a scenario that I believe is kind of a domino effect. And the domino effect is, is that because of COVID, because of what Saudi Arabia and Russia did last year, because of the new administration's Green Deal anti-hydrocarbon push, we as consumers are fixing to see, and I say fixing, that's my Texan in me, we're about to see probably one of the, the biggest change in oil and gas we've seen in my career. Now, I'm a little bit, I'm very, very conservative in many areas, and I'm not a big uh, arm waver, and I'm sure as heck not a big blue sky guy. I'm, I'm pretty straightforward. Everything I can see from production to supply to the cost of replication, the, rep the production cost to drill new wells, 
are so far out of the line that I'm easily seeing at the end of 2023, we will break a new record for the price of oil. I think we'll be over $150 a barrel. I said last year to my partners that because of what occurred in the shutdown of COVID and the oversupply, I said in April, everybody was running from oil and gas. Everybody was getting out. Everybody was talking about bankruptcy. And I told my partners, this will be the best going out of business sale you've ever participated on. The industry is imploding. Everybody's dumping assets as fast as they can. For those of us who are contrarian who have the stomach for it, we will never be able to buy oil and gas assets as cheap as they are today and probably for the next 12 to 24 months if you have the stomach for it. And fortunately for us as a company, we had a record year last year. We had a record number of new partners. And we had a record as far as the amount of assets we acquired for us in a single year. And that's probably going to be double or triple this year. Why is it? When I'm at negative $38 a barrel, it is clear to me there's only one way but up. If I'm in the gutter, I can look up. If I'm out in, in, in the sewer, I can look up to the gutter. In other words, we were so low, we were looking at negative $38 oil. They were paying people to take their oil contracts because the downside was a further deterioration in your, in your balance sheet. If that's true, where are we at today? Well, today we've rebounded from negative $38 a barrel back to current price at $65 a barrel. And so that means that oil has recovered fully from where it was prior to COVID. But there's one major problem a slice of the supply chain has been removed. The supply chain has been removed by about two to three million barrels of oil a day. Not only has the supply chain been removed, but literally thousands of wells in this country were shut in permanently as a result of being uneconomical, never to be put back online again. There was about a third to 40% of all the oil and gas companies from expiration, production, service companies, supply companies, equipment companies that are insolvent. They're gone, never to come back again. We ran off a million to a million and a half of our employees, not directly, but let's talk about the intellectual side. Not only the guys working on the rigs, but the guys with the food carts, the guys driving the trucks to bring supplies, the guys that were guys and gals that were working in engineering and, and drafting and geology and accounting, gone, gone. And they are now in other industries. They said, we are done. We are, we are tired of the up and down the oil and gas industry. So we've had this massive contraction and now comes the results of this contraction. The results are already in place. It's like a snowball rolling down a hill. It's too late to stop it because with the current administration, they've got three and a half or three, three years and 10 months left to keep doing what they're doing, which is to completely put up every obstacle they can for this industry, the oil and gas industry, to try to protect the consumer. Okay. So the U.S. economy is seemingly a domino about to fall. Now, that sounds dramatic, but let me tell you, if you just start working through the numbers, what the U.S. dollar is doing, supply and demand the amount of federal debt, what's happening to the real estate market, what's happening to hard money loans, when you start talking about Bitcoin, the stock market, uh, you say, well, yeah, the stock market's great. That's fantastic. Everybody loves the stock market until it crashes, all right? So the euphoria of stocks seems to be setting record highs and having common sense, uh, and it's all buried. You know, can the market plunge? You know, I was just going through this with my young staff the other day. The fact is, is that no one thinks the stock market can plunge to you walk in on a Monday morning and it's down five, six, eight, 10%. And that's just day one of about a five day route. The fact is when you can stand in a room and you talk to a bunch of your investment friends and they all sit there and say the same thing, which is, yeah, last year I made a 28 to 30% on my stock market portfolio. And everybody says they made the same investment. Then the arbitrage of that market has been already recognized and is gone. So it's like when you're standing in a crowded room and all of a sudden you notice that 10 minutes after you're looking around, 20% of the room is gone. And then about 30 minutes later, another third of the room is gone. You're wondering, okay, is there a fire? Is there a better something in the other room? Have I missed the invitation? And by the time you recognize the room is empty, you're day late and a dollar short. The question is, is the stock market in the same position? And why would the stock market be negatively affected by rising oil prices? Every single company that's traded in the U.S. stock exchange or anywhere, all are subject to oil and gas prices when it comes to manufacturing, processing, utilities, labor costs, the raw materials are being used, the, the uh, harvesting and mining of those raw materials. Every single component of every single company on the U.S. stock exchange is negatively affected, seemingly negatively affected by rising crude oil prices, except for those in the crude oil business, right? Okay. So what about the U.S. dollar? 
Now we can all debate this, and that's not really the part the part of the topic today. The part of the topic today is talking about the oil and gas space. But the U.S. dollar is going to be negatively affected by all the the debt that we've been adding. Added another one point nine trillion dollars this week to the to the U.S. Treasury the sales. The fact of the matter is, is if you look back in history, is the only way you can learn is by looking at what patterns have occurred previously and the variables to those patterns to try to discern to yourself where we're headed. In this case, as crude oil continues to rise, shows its tremendous resistance at $60 a barrel, the dollar seems to be going up. Well, why in the heck would it go up? Well, right now, the U.S. dollar is the, the least riskiest fiat currency in the world. We got the strongest currency. Well, that's fine. Today, it didn't take but six months to blow through the last $2 trillion. You know, it's not going to take another six or nine months to blow through this $1.9 trillion. I use this as an example. If I owe a million dollars to somebody because I borrowed the last five years and I went out and had fun and spent it on non-tangible items, and you give me another million dollars to a stimulus today, I don't really have money. I'm just paying off my debt. When California gets their $70 billion in this package, well, they owe $50 billion. They don't have $70 billion. They just paid off their previous debt. So this stimulus package is going to put money into the market, but once the funny money's gone, if you look at the pattern with rising crude oil prices, crude oil went to $145 a barrel and the dollar went to 70. But they didn't have $20 trillion in debt when that occurred in 2008. They didn't have four to seven trillion new dollars pumped in the economy, inflating the dollar. You add that component, what we're looking at, folks, is the dollar has to sink and it's going to sink big time. I easily see the dollar below 80. Now, let's talk about where the dollar is on Friday. I think it closed at like just over 91. We had uh, collateral damage is, is the fact that as inflation starts to rise, consumer goods go up, uh, everything starts to become more expensive. Now we're faced with what we're faced with looking at where do we park our money that allows us to take a benefit, a gain from inflation? Well, let me go throw it into a certificate of deposit in the bank making 3%. Good luck finding that, but let's say hypothetically it was there. Well, that's great, except unless inflation is at 4, 5, 6, 7%. Many of you on this particular presentation are probably old enough to remember the late 1970s, 1980s. I was a kid. I didn't know anything about inflation, but I knew I went from a gallon of milk to a box of uh, powdered milk. And my mother would throw it in a big old jar of water and say, see this uh, dishwater soap, water looking thing? Well, that's your new milk for your new cereal box because inflation was so high. Inflation ran from like six and a half percent rate to like 23, 24%. And it did it in less than 36 months. So most of us that have not experienced it, most of you have not experienced, they're saying, oh, it'll never happen. It can't happen. Oh, yes, it can. It can happen overnight in a heartbeat. All right. So when we have raging inflation, how's that going to affect the oil and gas industry? Well, it's going to affect the oil and gas industry because everything that goes into drilling new wells is going to cost more. See, the logic is, I saw a JP Morgan report yesterday. The JP Morgan report said, hey, look, uh, we think that the oil industry, shale industry is going to come back and start drilling more wells now that oil prices are up to $67 a barrel. That's a bunch of nonsense. They're barely able to get back in covenants of their current loan. When they pay down their lines of credit, the lines of credit are being shrunk, not extended. If you have a half a billion dollars in, in loans out there and you are able to pay 20 or 30 million down, the banks say now you have a $450 million line of credit because we don't think you can even survive on the remaining wells you have because your wells are declining. You can't drill enough new wells. Your collateral is shrinking. Oh, yeah, but oil's at $67 a barrel. I know. I know you're like a crackhead. You're like a meth user. You need another hit of cash. But I'm telling you, until you get yourself on the wagon, we're not giving you any more money. So inflation is going to be a fundamental factor that's going to stop oil and gas from going out and drilling new wells to fill the supply as a result of uh, rising crude oil prices. I'm just looking to see if I have anything in this little box to the right. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so let's go on. Now, by the way, I've, I've seen this, I've read this, and I've been following it, but they say if you really, really want to see where you have raging inflation, you need to start looking at things like lumber cost and copper. They're two leading indicators of exactly where the market is going. And if you look at what lumber's done in the last 12 months and what copper's done in the last 12 months, we are in inflation. It's not this 2% that they want to report in the government level. It's probably running closer to 4 to 7%. And if you add in energy and food, it could be much higher than that. All right, let me move forward. All right, so total energy weight on the economy. What does a barrel of oil do to um, the economy? Well, what it does is it does a lot of things. First thing is it does is it goes ahead and causes higher prices. 
It causes alternative uh, decision making by the consumer. They decide whether they want to go on a vacation. They decide they want to take a plane. They want to drive. Uh, we'll see a much bigger trade deficit. Uh, we're going to see a continuation of anything that is immediately derived from the use of oil, running tractors and backhoes and sawmills and, and all your plants creating your steel. It's all going to go higher and higher and higher. I'll use my steel company as an example. Although we had a tremendous number of, of oil companies go out of business, our steel company that we make big steel production tanks up in Oklahoma, we decided at the very last minute in December of 2018, I said, build every tank you can build even though nobody's ordering tanks because we will have the, the best tanks, cheapest tanks when the oil market comes back that they want to buy. And so we sat there for 18 months with about a million dollars of tanks sitting in the yard with nobody buying any steel tanks. About four months ago, when the oil industry decided that prices were higher and they wanted to complete their wells, they said, look, we got to find tanks. Nobody had any tanks because nobody built tanks for inventory. Everybody said, fire your welders, get rid of your staff, don't buy new steel and, and just get rid of every tank you have any way you can. We took a different approach. I'm constantly being a contrarian. But at the end of the day, what happens is now we sold every tank we had in the yard the last 90 days. The problem is the new tank that we would build, the exact same tank that we would build for our customer, instead of being eight or $9,000 for a 400 barrel tank would be more like $14,000 for a brand new tank because of the rise of cost of steel and parts. That oil company doesn't like $67 a barrel when their drilling costs and production costs are going to go up 30, 40, 50%. And that's where they're going to head. So inflation, even though it helps oil prices, even though oil prices benefit from inflation, it's going to prolong or delay expiration. As a result, they're going to incur the same kind of problem the US economy is going to replace. You're talking about labor. They want to put $15 an hour. I don't care what they want to put. The fact is you're going to have to pay what you can afford to pay to build new houses and apartment complex, et cetera. We're dealing with a problem, and the problem is it's a storm that's not going to slow down. All right, so oil prices were $61 last week. It's now up to like $65 or $66. It's showing tremendous resilience at that $60 oil price. I still have been telling my partners it probably could drop back to $55 a barrel, but I believe it will finish this year in 2031 over $65 a barrel. The uh, strategic reserves announced last week, they're going to let loose about three and a half million barrels a day. This is oil they bought back in April of last year to fill up the salt domes and all the storage because President Trump was trying to help the industry by absorbing those barrels because there was no storage. Now, under the normal federal policy, they have to sell that back into the market. So the feds are making a great return on their money. But that means for a temporary 60 to 90 days, we have an additional three and a half million barrels coming to the market. Even with that announcement, oil stayed at 62 to $66 a barrel, which shows you how tight the market has gotten between supply and demand. We were at about 1.3 billion barrels of excess supply last year that was produced during the shutdown in April, May, June. 1.3 billion barrels around the globe. Well, we've been slowly, methodically absorbing three to four million barrels of that in the United States every single day. So if you do the math across the globe, the fact is that although we're back to almost 20 million barrels a day, about three to four million barrels of that a day has been coming not from uh, Saudi Arabia and OPEC. It's been coming out of the excess supply that we had in, not only in our country, but the excess supply that they had. So what I'm pointing out is we've been kind of delayed in the natural market response to where oil prices should be and will be as a result of this excess draw on, on supply that's been stored up since last April and the Federal Reserve now dumping from the strategic reserves three and a half million barrels a day. All right, so why crude oil prices and, and, and what's going on? And I'm going to move quickly because I'm going to run out of time with Derek and I don't want Derek getting mad at me. So I'm going to keep cranking on this thing if I can. I'm trying to figure out how to clear the screen. It goes right there. Okay. All right, got it. Okay, so it's going to continue to rise for three fundamental reasons. Demand is rising, and it will rise even greater than it was pre-COVID. So the reality of it is you're going to see uh, oil demand go above 21 million barrels a day because all those things have shifted. We also own a small trucking company. We see the demand for trucking. We see a shortage in diesel. Uh, just pure demand alone is going to drive, drive, drive. I told my partners last year, don't worry about supply. Uh, because I said, worry about supply, not demand, because demand is always going to be there. Supply is going to be the fundamental issue. And that fundamental issue is coming to roost today because there's not enough new wells being drilled to replace the oil that we're now consuming. So at the end of the day, we have a supply problem, not a demand problem. Uh, when you talk about, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that oil is down from 13 million barrels a day last year to about 10 million barrels a, a day in output last week, 
even after the big Texas storm and the shutdown of refineries, even after you factor that out, I think we'll be sitting at less than 11 million barrels a day. If you look at 24 months ahead, the declines on these, the decline curves on these big wells, coupled with the fact we're not drilling new wells, tells me in my numbers, in my head, and the way I calculate it, we'll be below 9 million barrels a day in output by the end of 2023. So over the next 24 months, we should lose two to three million barrels of oil and output. And I don't care how fast they drill. You just can't outrun a 35% decline curve, which is very prevalent in these bigger wells. Okay. Now, the economy, it's going to be affected. I mean, let's forget the federal debt for a second. That's just, that's just going to destroy the value of our dollar. But now they're talking about an infrastructure plan with $2 trillion dedicated to infrastructure. Well, unless you plan on putting a solar uh, panel or a windmill on the back of that whole caterpillar or that big bulldozer, we're going to need a lot of oil. We're going to need a lot of gas. And guess what? We don't have the replacement out there. So the economy itself is going to expand. The economy is going to grow. Everybody wants a new boat and travel trailer. We're all driving now because we're not flying as much as we did. Uh, jet fuel is going to be definitely affected by rising crude oil prices. So that's going to put more pressure on not flying as ticket prices rise. We're, we're in a big mess. The mess, though, always comes up with the same answer. The same answer is I better own oil. I better own a lot of it. And I better be either in public stocks, I better be in ETFs, or I better be in minerals, or I better be in working interest. I better figure out how my portfolio is going to be affected because oil is going to stay very short in supply and very heavy in demand over the next five to 10 years. And this could be a very long haul because it's going to take a high sustainable price to crude oil to encourage capital to come back to the market. What does that mean? For the oil and gas industry to come back to life, they've got to pay down their debt, then go get capital and convince them that it's not going to happen again like it did in 2014 and happened in 2020, where Saudi Arabia and Russia are able to flood the market because we have so much debt and, and knock our knees out from under us. What's that going to take? I don't know the magic number, but I can tell you, in my mind, if I were a lender, I would not give the oil and gas sector money until oil was definitely over $100 a barrel and stay there for six to 12 months. I need to know you have plenty of reserves and plenty of cash for me to lend you money because you guys get clobbered every four to five years because of the collaborative effort of sovereign nations who use their government strength to kill our industry. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit, okay? Because a lot of this is just data and information, right? The cost of U.S. oil and gas is one thing. We are addicted to oil and gas. And the fact is, as an addicted country to oil and gas, the question then becomes, how do you participate in that addiction? How do you join oil and gas as an investment product when you're mainly a real estate investor? You're mainly a stock investor. You're mainly a cryptocurrency. Maybe you're into alternative investments in other areas. And you say to yourself, well, how if we're going to have rising demand or shrinking supply, how do I participate in the energy space? Well, let's start off with the first thing. The first thing you have to understand is, is that you must get started immediately. One of the reasons that we've spent so much time and effort working with professionals like Derek and Quest is that there is such a misconception of the oil and gas industry. I'll be the first to tell you, 90% of private investments in oil and gas are run by incompetents or out and out crooks. No questions about it. it. Could be as high as 95%. All right. So the fact of the matter is, is that if you have an industry that has such a bad reputation, how do you feel comfortable getting into it? Well, it's due diligence. It's, it's getting on and listening to the person that's going to manage your money and go, have they been in business five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Have they been through multiple cycles? Do, does the area that they're focused on make common sense? You know, do I want to be in mineral rights, the top of the food chain, or do I want to be all the way down into midstream, which is pipelines? Or do I want to be in refining? Do I want to be in saltwater wells? Maybe I don't want to be in any of that. I just want to be in an ETF where it's publicly traded, but now I'm subject to the public stock market gyrations. I think the real key is, do you recognize that the energy space is where you want to be? A question just popped up as I was talking about, you know, how do I see, I think, the effect of, of batteries? Let's see what it says. How does it ramp up for electric batteries and motor cars affect oil demand? So let's, let's give you an answer before I turn this over to Derek, because I could go on for another 20 minutes, and all I'm going to do is convince you you need to be in oil and gas, no matter what. But here, here, let's summarize it. When we talk about solar, wind, electric cars, and batteries, and we talk about the oil and gas industry is going to be less in demand going forward, oh, I agree with you. As a percentage of overall energy use. So let's just use simple math. If today I had 100 as being the marker of consumption of energy today, within that 100, Maybe 70, 75% is made up of hydrocarbon consumption 
which creates that energy and the rest of it comes from hydro, nuclear, coal, et cetera. When we go forward, because of the social movement, because of the alternatives like electric cars and batteries and the different things that are being evolved, as a complete outside hydrocarbon, outside of the carbon market, you're going to see an increase as a percentage of the total. So now we move forward 10 years, and let's say we're at 125 versus 100. So that's 25 more units of energy use going forward. But let's say hydrocarbons doesn't change. We're still at 70, 75 but it stays the same for the next 10 years. It doesn't mean it's going to be consumed less. It just means it's a percentage smaller than the total. I personally want you to remember that replacement cost of oil and gas or replacement cost for alternative energy means that, that oil's got to be $85 to $100 a barrel for solar or wind to even be closely, close to being economically viable or comparable. If that's true, you and I, are, you know, we're all about saving the planet. We're all about things like you know, making the world a better place. But when I get my electric bill from my local utility provider here in Dallas, it says, would you like to pay an extra 20% and use wind energy or pay your electric bill? Eh, I'll use wind later. Today, I'll pay my electric bill. In other words, without subsidies, without the government subsidizing these industries, without the consumer just absolutely falling in love with saving the planet, which we all care about, but very few are willing to make that personal sacrifice, oil and gas is here to stay. And the reality of it is, is because of the proficiency of the oil and gas industry, what you now have is you have such a proficient industry, we've increased our output by almost 350% in 11 years. And if we didn't have Saudi Arabia doing what they did and Russia doing what they did, we'd have been at 15 or 16 million barrels a day output today. And the fact of the matter is we'd be almost energy, energy independent. So at the end of the day, as Derek starts to ask me some questions from the audience, et cetera, keep this in mind. Because of modern technology, we are now at a phase in this industry we've never been before. It's about exploitation, not exploration. It's about manufacturing process and rate of return more so than super high risk, depending on how you enter it. Derek, I'll turn it back to you, my friend. I'm sorry about the video at the beginning as far as the PowerPoint, but I think I was able to multitask and pretend it like I knew what I was talking about anyway. So I'm going to hand it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so now I switched to my phone audio. Do I sound okay? Sounds great. You're clear as a will. Awesome. Clear, clear as a bell. Awesome. Awesome. So Actually, I think the uh, issues in the beginning show actually how much knowledge you really have. You didn't need to go based off the PowerPoint. You didn't need to go based off some sort of thing because you've been doing this for so, so long. So I think that's actually really, really unique just to show that type of level of, you know, experience. So one of the things that you actually didn't mention in this is if I'm looking to buy mineral rights, right, and I want to be a mineral right owner, yep. there's a reason I shouldn't be purchasing. Now, I live in Texas, Okay. But why should I not purchase mineral rights in Texas? Because I've heard a lot of horrendous things, and there's a and uh, there's certain states maybe you should purchase mineral rights in. Can you walk me through some of that? Yeah. So the main thing that Derek's asking is our company decided three years ago to focus on being at the top of the food chain, which is being a mineral rights owner, and we mainly focus on mineral rights in these shale basins. So. Buying minerals is easy, Derek, as you know. I mean, you can literally look at the bulletin board in a truck stop and buy a mineral acre, okay? The reality of it is, is every state in the country has certain rules and regulations within like the Texas Railroad Commission, the Oklahoma Commission, Louisiana. Each state has their own laws. So like Louisiana's French law. So it treats it differently, right? The reality of it is, is that there are certain states that use the land grant days that actually went back and said, we're going to divide our whole state into one square mile sections. You get your stake, ride your horse, put your stake in the ground. That's your, that's your surface and your mineral rights. And that evolved over a hundred years. But what really is the problem is that as a mineral owner, there's multiple layers that you have to understand and comprehend. Well, the first one is I need to make sure that I have the same rights as a 10 acre mineral owner as the guy that owns a thousand acres next to me. I don't want the guy with a thousand acres be able to carve me out of a producing well, have such a significant influence that it minimizes or diminishes the value of my acreage position. Oklahoma, North Dakota, uh, there are states that have set their states up under what they call forced pooling. It simply is a simple way of saying everybody in the defined producing well all has equal rights proportioned to the minerals you own. Texas doesn't have that. Texas allows you to create your own unit, your own production unit, and it could be, instead of being a square, it can look like a fried egg that landed on the ground. It can be all over the board as a result of how the oil company figures is the best interest for them. So if you're a super smart mineral owner, you kind of get carved out because guess what? They don't want you with a higher royalty in their unit. They want the guy that doesn't know what he's doing. 
In Oklahoma, all the cards are on the table. It's about everybody understanding the rules of the game. And so, therefore, in my case, your case, we like Oklahoma because it is a much easier, simplistic way for the average investor to understand the rules of the game. Perfect. So uh, one of the things is, uh, if you look in the question box, a guy named Jeff asked, you know, okay. hey, they don't live in Oklahoma. How can they invest with someone like yourself, right? If they want to get in contact with, you know, Eckerd Enterprises and invest with you, is that possible? Yeah, yeah it is, Derek. Uh, one of the things I should point out is that it's no different than buying good wine. If I want to buy good wine, it's in California, right? Texas has wine. I'm not saying it's good wine. I'm just saying it's, they've got wine, right? So a lot of, I've heard this for 30 years, and like, well, I only invest locally. You know, I only do real estate right here in my hometown of Philadelphia or wherever I'm at. And the problem with oil and gas is that oil and gas is located where the dinosaurs decided to lay down and take their last breath. It is where it is. In this case, case Oklahoma is the fourth largest producing oil state in the country. Uh, and what, what the answer is, is that you can invest with companies like Eckerd. There are also publicly traded uh, mineral companies like Brigham Minerals and stuff on the stock exchange. But if you look at the difference, the difference is they're totally subject to what the stock exchange does. And the bulk of the profits goes back to the publicly traded company, not in your pocket. With our company, as you know, Derek, we have many portfolios. Our clients will buy and they own the minerals directly. We manage them and they can buy in increments of dollar amounts or by acre. And we've done this for years. But all you do is you have to be qualified as an accredited investor. Uh, you have to give us an idea of what you're trying to accomplish. Are you into growth or income or income as a main focus? And then we work with you on how you want to invest. Is this going to come out of your regular investment account? Or do we need to turn you over to Quest, let you set up a professional self-directed IRA and start using your IRA? I mean, I'm moving money out of my wife, my daughter, my account this week for some specific minerals through Quest because we've got capital sitting out there that I'm trying to move out of the stock market. I, I think stock market is going to take a massive correction and I'm moving capital this week because I think that's the right thing to do. But yeah, investing with us is easy. You just have to be qualified. Perfect. Now, one question that popped up and I relate to it as the stock market, like, wait, shouldn't I be buying mineral rights when gas prices go up? Right. And if you, uh, the overall question was kind of the conclusion of it, of it, you know, but why would you not want to wait until prices go up to purchase those type of mineral rights. Yeah, the, 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 the highest price on the Titanic was the last ticket to get off, right? <laughs> so if you wait till gas prices go up or oil prices go up, the arbitrage is gone, right? So the reality of it is, is that you could go buy in the stock market right now at 32,000 on the Dow. Well, if you get to the top of Mount Everest, there's nothing any higher, it's just straight fall off a cliff. Contrarian is you buy low, you sell high. And the truth is, is that the lead time in drilling wells is 12 to 36 months. When Exxon decides to drill a well, they got to lease the minerals today, run it through their land and accounting and operations. Right? They may not drill the well to the end of 2022. So the lead time can be 24 months before you ever see a drill bit. By the time you get your first check, it might be 28 months. Now I'm stretching this out. They can go faster. But I think the viewing audience needs to understand this is not about timing. This is about looking at your portfolio and the foundation of your portfolio and saying, I need so much in public stock, so much in real estate, so much in my retirement, so much in direct accessible capital. But I also need something in the energy space, which drives all those other markets. And if I don't have something in energy, I've left myself vulnerable to the significant changes when energy prices rise or lower to a significant degree. So today, if I had called you last April, you're right. Gas price were negative $38 a barrel. Natural gas is $1.60. Perfect time to buy. You didn't call me. I didn't call you. But I had a whole bunch of smart partners, 300 plus accredited clients. We bought everything we could get our octopus arms on as fast as we could. We just couldn't do it fast enough. Now, one thing that's really unique is Quest has had other mineral rights and oil and gas individuals come in here and talk before. But one thing that started to raise some red flags was, man, these companies seem to show up out of nowhere to sell their mineral rights and, and then boop, they're gone. So how long have you really been in business and doing this? And I found this out, which is why you named the company after your name, right? <laughs> yeah. So can you elaborate well, a little bit on that? Yeah, two answers. So when I first started the business in 1985, I had no money. It was a dropout of college and, and went to work for a small firm. But uh, one of my first big partners was a guy by the name of uh, Rod Sands. He was the former CFO of, of Pace Picani Sauce. And Rod was a big guy. And I, I met him in San Antonio. He said, you know, Troy, I only invest with people who put their own money out. 
I said, man, I'm like 21 years old. I don't have that kind of money. He goes, do you have any money at all to invest? I go, well, yeah, I got a little bit. He goes, you start investing with your money, I'll start investing with you. And so the reality is I started buying my first interest in wells in 1986 and uh, started buying minerals in 1986. The other thing is, is that because of that lesson, I felt like I should always be the lead investor. If I'm going to sell something, I should have as much money as I think is appropriate. And just, I should be in every deal with all my partners. So I am. And what you said is absolutely correct. You're going to see mineral sellers come out of the woodworks like cockroaches when the lights go off because they can't sell a drilling deal. They can't sell a lot of the other investments that are out there. So all these liars, crooks, thieves, thieves and cheats have been sitting at home thinking, who the heck can I sell? What can I sell? And how can I, how can I get away with it? The problem with that space is that you, there's a lot more to buying minerals and saying, here's a mineral for sale. I buy it. I deed it. Now I own it. I talk to clients every day who invested in minerals that are 50 miles on the wrong side of the base and they're, they're out of the swimming pool. They're sitting in the grass and can't even get their toe wet. What really gives us advantage, Derek, as you saw the other night at dinner is we have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and 35 years of experience tearing apart the components, the geology, the geophysics, the oil companies, the operators. We understand the dynamics of the market because if I'm going to be a real estate owner, which minerals are real estate, who's the best builder? Who's the best contract? Who's the best property manager? That's who I'm going to buy with. And that's who I'm going to let sell me the property, manage my property, et cetera. And that's really the hard thing. Investors get caught up with, well, the guy sounds good. He sounds like a nice guy from South Texas and he wears a suit and tie. And I know of two or three funds right now. I know of one right now, Derek, there's a fund out there. The guy is actually a felon, spent two years in prison. He's trying to raise a hundred plus million dollars. He's using his Ponzi scheme track record of 2013 to promote why he's a mineral expert and he's raising money as a felon and he's people are investing with him. They don't do their homework, right? So what you say and what I say is the same thing. I don't care if it's Bitcoin. I don't care if it's real estate. I better do some homework and find out who I'm talking to, which is why you and I come out on a Saturday to have these educational presentations because we're trying to say, look, you got to look at Quest and find out how they are as a custodian. I've done my homework on Quest. They're top of the line, right? Clients have to figure out who they want to invest with. The other thing is, is that this COVID has given everybody a reason to not meet face-to-face. -face. Pretty hard to be somebody you're not when you meet face-to-face -face at dinner. And after a 20-minute conversation at dinner, you know if you have an empty brain or somebody really knows their business. I eat, sleep, and breathe what I do, and I've been doing this since I was 20 years old. I love what I do. Every day I wake up is an exciting day for me. So, I mean, it's, it's just really a business that I have come to really know inside and out. Now... Um, I'm going to kind of let you take the reins just for a second because we only have about 10 minutes left and there's a few questions in the chat box and the Q&A area. Can you take two seconds, review those for me real fast and if you can't tackle? Yeah, I, I can. Done... I'll tackle the, the last question. The, the, the uh, person that asked the question said, hey, I'm in the only gas industry. I'm out in uh, the Permian and I work for one of the big producers out here. Would uh, this affect my ability to make investments in the industry? I think that answer is because my son is a petroleum engineer. He worked for a publicly traded company. And he asked his management team, hey, can I invest in minerals with my dad's company? They said, absolutely, as long as he's not in the basin that I'm in. The good news is if your company is invested and you're working out in the Midland Basin, you probably have to get approval from your manager as to can you buy minerals. And the answer is probably going to be the same. You can do anything you want as long as you're not anywhere in the area that we're in because we don't want insider trading if we're public. And we don't want you finding out where our rig's moving. You're trying to buy underneath the rig and maybe you're buying minerals we want to buy as a company. Um, in fact, it's interesting, Derek, you saw this the other night, probably 20% of our investors are attorneys, which is crazy. Most people say, oh, don't ever sell an attorney. I'm like, they don't bother me. Probably 20% of our clients are in the oil and gas business. They're either lawyers from the oil and gas business, they're engineers, they're geologists. We have petroleum engineers that invest with us in our minerals, and they all have the same comment. We can't find minerals of the quality that you find, Troy, at the price you find. Why in the heck, are, why, why don't we just invest with you? And so, I want to point out for those of you that are asking these type of questions is we actually go after and we work with oil and gas industry types because we want the smartest, best clients on board with us because we see an open window for the next 10 years of buying minerals because it's a half a trillion dollar industry. Um, some of the, the last questions that a lot of your points are spot on. Um, why did we go from number one oil and gas industry a decade ago where it is today, especially cost of renewable energy, uh, Biden administration, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The reason why the oil, so the question really is, look, 
why is oil and gas prices going to go to all-time highs, Troy? We're talking about alternative energy coming in, et cetera, et cetera. All right, this is a simple equation. Ready? We're consuming 20 million barrels a day, and we're not even fully out of COVID lockdown. Saudi Arabia just said, we're not giving you any more. Do you know where Saudi Arabia and Russia got the extra oil they flooded the market with last year? Out of their reserves. They didn't go drill new wells and put on new production. They pulled from their reserves. What they did is that they set an example by saying oil and gas industry in the United States showed us in 2014 that they can survive at $38 a barrel, which was their first attempt. Saudi came out in April and said, we're going to offer Saudi sweet crude at $25 a barrel because they already calculated we couldn't operate at $25 a barrel, and they were right. So now we know the new threshold of pain. The threshold of pain is we've got to figure out how to survive at $25 a barrel. Now, I said back in April, the oil and gas industry couldn't survive very long, or at least Saudi Arabia and Russia could not survive at 25. It was a 60-day game of chicken, and they gave up very quick. But to answer your question, renewable energy is a joke, okay? It's going to be an important part of our energy future. What do you think those solar panels are made from? What do you think those windmills are made from? What do you think all this is made from? How do you think? I'm watching semi-trucks haul blades made out of oil and gas, fabricated from oil and gas, the raw material out of oil and gas, and I'm saying... Do you guys not get this? Does the industry not get this? I'm saying we have 20 million barrels of demand a day, and we're down to 10 million barrels. We're down 3 million barrels since March. If any other industry said we're losing 20 to 30% of supply, but demand is 100%, you have only one thing, but that's escalation. And to answer your question very specific, because we're running out of time, the fact of the matter is, is that the supply chain is broken because nobody's going to give the oil companies new capital to drill new wells. We should be drilling 800 to 1,000 wells a day right now just to stay even. So in 24 months, when you and I want more gas and oil and we're down to 9 million barrels a day, what do you think Saudi and Russia are going to do? Give us that extra 2 million barrels? I'm going to, Sorry, guys, we just can't do it. They're going to reap $150, $200 a barrel. They're going to store a trillion dollars in their bank and they're going to cut our legs off again. So the question is, do you wait to see if I'm right in two years or do you buy mineral interest today, today, oil and gas interest, whether it's public or private, today, knowing that what you're buying is safe, it's based on today's economics, and the rest of it's just blue sky upside? I don't know. That's what I'm going to do. Now, Troy, as we kind of come to a close, how can people get in contact? Because we got now we got now the flood of questions come in, of course, right? Yeah. <laughs> So what is the best way to either call or email or how, how can people start to reach out? Because guys, we're not going to get to all your questions, right? But I promise you, if you reach out, Troy and uh, Eckerd Enterprise are very open about all the, all the things that you guys are talking about right there in the chat box. Well, so- let, let me tell you where we're at. And Derek, thanks for, thanks for having me on today. And look, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say, I'm, I'm always a bit. My cell phone number is 469-422-1781. Cell phone. You can call me directly. I'm the CEO. I run- 469 469- 422-1781. My office number is 800-527-8895. That my secretary, Carmel Ross, will grab the phone. She'll get you on the line with me, find me. I live, eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff. I sleep about six hours a night. I don't need more. That's just the way it is. I, I'm okay with that. The other thing is you can always email me at my personal email, teckard at eckardenterprises.com, T-E-C-K-A-R-D at eckardenterprises.com. But before we leave, I want to part with this. Look, it doesn't matter if you invest with my company or public stocks. Nine and a half out of 10 people in oil and gas are going to rip you off. Don't be a victim. If you're looking at somebody else's deal, call me. I'll tear it apart. I'll tell you what they're doing. If it's good, I'll tell you it's good. I'll tell you what I like about it and don't like about it. I don't care if you invest with me or not. That's your choice. Second thing is, is that with our company, we work with clients and partners like Derek in, in the educational realm. We have dinners like we did the night before last. And 50 of our clients came and they all met and greeted each other. And they all said, hey, is Troy a liar? And we'll beat him like a pinata or is he a good guy? And we should all become and know each other. Now those clients are becoming very protective of one another. Derek did a great job meeting a lot of my clients and hey, we're here to help. So it's about you taking the time to become integrated and know me, know Derek. Surround yourself with smart, intelligent people and you'll find yourself less vulnerable to being that lone zebra out there that gets picked off by the lion. The um, right as we end, I'm going to be selfish, Troy. I'm be selfish, in. brother. Go for it. <laughs> I want people to set up accounts and work with people like you. Uh, we've seen, you know, oh, I, I've had the uh, fortunate experience. That I always say, see behind the curtain, right? Yep. I knew you yep. for two years before yep. I ever did a single investment because I wanted to see everything that you guys were doing as a company. 
And yes, so sir. I, as an individual, finally kind of took that leap and uh, I've been very excited, you know? Yep. So if, if I am a brand new person on here and I'm looking to do something with you, uh, can I get you to give them something? Can I get you to... Oh, you don't have to do that. Here, here's our standard policy with Eckerd Enterprises. If you decide to invest with our company, and if you decide to utilize your retirement accounts by setting up a self-directed IRA, we provide a $500 credit to be used to set up a new account with Quest. So if you say, I want to move my traditional IRAs, I want to set up Quest, we'll cover the first, up to the first $500 for that account. But what if I have two IRAs or I have a Roth IRA, and I don't know all the background, that's the operational stuff. But what I'm saying is the following. We're in this for the long haul. We just, we just leased out an entire four-star resort in Western Colorado to have all of our clients come out there. We're paying for a three-day trip. Why? We're going to talk business. We're going to talk about the dollar. We're going to have all kinds of information, but we do it because we want you to know it's important we have the right financial partners. Well, that financial partner also includes putting your retirement money to work, your 401k transitioning out of a traditional IRA. I had a client come in two days ago, Derek. He said, my wife and I got with this IRA. We got this Roth. We haven't even looked at it. It's a disaster. I said, get it all together. Contact Derek over at Quest. Put those funds and put them to work. She goes, yeah, I don't even think we're making 1%. It's because they're unknowledgeable. They don't know what they're doing. They're kind of like, I don't want to spend all that money. I said, look, it's not expensive. I'll cover the first $500. I go, you will? And it's crazy, but sometimes they'll say, I don't want to spend the, the $200 to set up an account. My standard policy with your firm, Derek, with Quest, we pay up to $500 for that new account because I know the customer service and I know the way your company is going to treat them. And plus, it just makes sense. We've got a lot of money in IRAs that are not working. We've got to get working on putting those monies to work. Everyone, I want you to hear that real quick. Quest, we do four events on average a week, sometimes more. We've never ever has someone to be so confident in what they do that they are willing to cover $500 if you're setting up an account to do things and look at their company. Imagine that. It doesn't even cost you guys something to go through these type of motions. So take a moment, reach out to Troy. Troy, let me get your phone number one more time, uh, that and the office number so people can grab that again. Yeah, my cell number is 469-422-1781. Now, what, you, what I suggest you do is that if you call me, and I don't answer, text me, tell me your name, tell me you met me on today's quest. I'll call you back probably within three or four hours. I've got a brand new grandbaby. So I'm going to go see my sixth grandbaby this afternoon, but you call me, you text me, tell me who you are. I'll call you right back. Tell me when's a convenient time. I'll do that. I don't care if you're qualified or not. I don't care if you're going to invest with me or not. You might have questions. I'd be glad to expand on those answers for you. And that'd be great. And then if you want to call the office during the week, it's 800-527-8895. And a little side note to that. We've had the same 800 number since 1991, 1991. My 800 number is older than most of the guys calling you to sell your investments on the phone. That's, <laughs> that, that doesn't require marketing. That's just facts. So, you know, hey, Derek, once again, incredible. Thanks for having me on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I could talk about there's a lot more to this industry. Hopefully, Derek and I can get together the next three or four weeks because there's a lot more that's being tied in. I've got some great guests that I'd love to have Derek have on his show uh, because I think you need to start really looking at how energy is going to affect your overall portfolio. It's, it's, we're in a very dynamic position right now. Now's not the time to think about, hey, I'll get to it next month or six months now. This is important. You focus today and take action. Set your account up with Quest. Get that started. If you don't have the account set up, you can't do anything about it. Get the account set up. Derek will help you through it. We'll pay for it then decide what you want to do with your money. Because right now, you better be paying attention. We, we're in a very, very interesting times. Troy, thank you so much. Once I click this little red button, we're, we're hanging up everything. And you have fun with your grandkids, okay? All right. See you guys. I'm going to send my new granddaughter. Take care. <laughs> Bye, guys.